Hi, my name is Erica Vieira and I've interviewed nearly 300 YouTubers and this is what I learned. Have there been certain times where you've taken risks with your channel? There is some benefit to just getting on and just doing something like every day. That's crazy. So yeah. your third or fourth video right after that you started your channel, it got almost 2 million views. So for you, did you have any experience whatsoever being in front of a camera? So what happened in that moment where you decided to really take it seriously? Hi, my name is Erica Vieira and I am the host of the number one rated and longest running podcast called the YouTube Power Hour Podcast for women on YouTube. I started this podcast way back in 2015. I've had a few breaks here and there when I had two of my children, but I've been pretty consistent and I've interviewed a lot of YouTubers. On top of that, I have a YouTube bootcamp for women called the Zero to Influence YouTube Bootcamp and I run and manage several channels here on YouTube. So let's just say I've learned a lot about YouTube, the people that make YouTube videos and the overall YouTube world. Also, when I'm doing my interviews, keep in mind that sometimes before or after, I will stay on with the creator if they have questions or they wanna talk and sometimes we get into some really deep conversations about some of the things that we talked about during the show. And these are things that are a little bit more sensitive that they don't necessarily want everybody to hear about. So I've got a really unique insight into the YouTube industry as a whole. And in this video, I'm gonna be sharing with you four things that I learned from interviewing so many YouTube creators. I won't be naming any names, but I will be sharing some really juicy stories and insight and stay to the end because I've got the juiciest of them all. And let me tell you, it was quite the experience. So without further ado, let's get started. Back when I first started interviewing people in 2015, a lot of the people I interviewed, they didn't really know or understand why they were so popular on YouTube or have any like really serious strategies other than have fun or be yourself. Because in all fairness, that's what these people were doing and still seeing a lot of success when the platform wasn't nearly as saturated with as many creators as it is today. So that vice definitely has changed over the years. There was even a time a little while ago where I started to change the questions because every single time I asked a question, what would be your number one piece of advice for anyone on YouTube? It would always be be yourself, be authentic. Don't take it too seriously, have fun. That advice was totally true back in 2015, 2016, 2017, and it still applies today, but the times on YouTube definitely have changed. The competition back then just wasn't nearly as stiff as it is today, and they were early adopters on a platform that would eventually blow up and blow up big. Over the years, I have noticed creators starting to get a lot more savvy. They seem to have more awareness on why they succeed, or they seem to actually come onto YouTube with the goal of it being a career. Back years ago, people were not coming onto YouTube to make it a career because they didn't even know it could be a career. So a lot of those people that I interviewed that had seen some success and been on YouTube for a while, they were truly just getting onto the platform to have fun to have, as a hobby. But today, so many people know and understand the true opportunity that YouTube has that a lot of people are being a lot more savvy with how they're launching on the platform. Now, the answer when I asked that question is what is your number of advice for people that want to get started on YouTube? It varies from um, you know, know your audience, create content for them, your thumbnails, your titles, SEO, all these different things that we know are really important for YouTube success. The bottom line is YouTube has changed. People are understanding the true possibility of having a career on YouTube and they're not just treating it as a hobby. And because of the fact that there's so many more creators on YouTube, it's less likely that you can treat YouTube as a hobby and really blow up on it and build a career. While being yourself is a huge central tenant of seeing success on YouTube, being yourself is not enough anymore. And having fun is not enough anymore. Yes, you wanna have fun on YouTube. Yes, you wanna be passionate about YouTube, but it's not enough. You've gotta be strategic as well. I know this isn't juicy or scandalous and you're gonna have to wait till later on in the video for the juicy part. The people that I've met through the podcast, like 99% of them are wonderful, lovely people. Everyone pretty much has been so wonderful, so professional, so appreciative of being asked to be on the show and they're just very respectful. I've been so lucky to get to know some amazing people through this podcast. I've been so lucky that for the most part, most of my guests have been truly wonderful. I even have some guests on the show that are dear friends of mine that we speak on a daily basis and I met them 
through the podcast. It leads me to conclude that female YouTube creators overall are a pretty good bunch. Many of them are hardworking and they're sincere in their interest in wanting to help people through their content. I actually think that a lot of YouTubers get lumped into the whole influencer scene and they get a bad rap as influencers. I do think that YouTubers are a different breed than some of the other social platforms out there. And although many YouTubers have an Instagram, have a TikTok, it isn't necessarily vice versa. It isn't that most Instagrammers or TikTokers have a YouTube channel. YouTubers are a different breed than other influencers. YouTubers, in my experience as a whole, are hardworking, they are driven, they're motivated, and they're very sincere with wanting their content to help others. And they sincerely wanna do well by their subscribers. Although I have some stories of some guests that weren't so nice, the vast majority of them, like 99% of them, truly are nice people. And I'm not just saying that. There's no way I could have continued on doing this podcast week after week, interviewing hundreds upon hundreds of YouTubers if these people sucked. <laughs> and that's part of the reason why I have such a favorable impression of YouTubers. Not to mention I work with so many of them. I run a bunch of different channels. I manage different channels and I do a lot of one-on-one -on -one coaching. Overall, I've been really lucky that almost everyone I've come in contact with have really been wonderful people. Maybe it's just only my experience, but that's been the case for me. Most of the people that have come onto my show, they're pretty open. Most don't have a lot of demands, except for a few. I also think that if someone was wanting to hide certain parts of them or not really share their story, they wouldn't agree to be on the show in the first place. So keep in mind, you know, my subject pool are people that are willing to get onto a podcast and talk about their lives. So prior to coming onto the show, I have people fill out a form where I ask them questions about, you know, their YouTube channel and what they're comfortable sharing versus what they're comfortable not sharing. My favorite guests though are the people that say I'm an open book I will share anything I love that because that's truly what makes the podcast really cool is for people to be really open honest vulnerable and share their really true experiences both good and bad so that we can all learn so that my audience and you watching and listening so that you can learn from it so here are some of the things though that I get that people do not want to talk about the first which you probably guessed it is income I do have some people say yeah ask me anything and I have a lot of people saying no I'll talk about income but I really don't want to get specific I don't want to get specific to how much or how little or whatever so don't ask me specifics about numbers which I'll be honest is something I find a little bit disappointing because I do feel that the more authentic that all of us are in this industry about how much we make and about how much brands pay is, the better for everybody because if there's a certain expectation then brands have to meet that right so I do think it's better for there to be more transparency about what people pay or are paid in this industry and part of my goal with my podcast is to have that transparency is to be able to have those conversations so that other people can learn from that which is why I'm really really grateful for those of my guests who are open to talking about money because it is such an important topic and one that does not get discussed enough another thing that I find that people don't want to talk about is their own personal romantic relationships which I get I'm, I'm a pretty private person I love talking about things but when it comes to my own private life like mm, I don't like to be out there so much and some people have even come out to say um, I'm getting a divorce my audience doesn't know yet do not mention anything about my family do not mention anything about my spouse I've had other people say hey I was in this relationship a very well-known relationship with another youtuber I don't want to talk about that at all so I have had people come out and say do not mention anything about my relationship which I totally get because I don't really get onto that on the show but it is interesting that that is something that they want to put on their form and like do not ask me about that I've had other people say that they've had bad experiences with managers or MCMs but they don't want to talk about it and this isn't a as much anymore I have this a lot back in the day when there are a lot more creators that were part of the MCNs or multi-channel networks and a lot of them were getting some bad experiences and I did have some people that were open about sharing those experiences on the podcast but I did have quite a few people saying that like oh no I, I, I don't want to talk about it don't talk to me about it like they're under some like legal litigation and they can't talk about it or they just didn't want to ruffle any feathers so she said, don't ask me about that or like managers like past managers and they say oh no I don't want to say anything about that you know we're in a lawsuit with my manager so that was actually that's actually something that's come up like quite a bit not recently but I'd have to say in previous years it's definitely something that come up and obviously I honor and respect that 
So speaking of demands, here are a few demands that I have gotten over the years, especially once the interview has gone live. The first thing is thumbnails. So for a long time, I did not put the podcast on the YouTube channel, but as of you know the last year and a half or so, I do. I have been putting all my podcasts on the YouTube, and of course, when you're on YouTube, you have to have a thumbnail and the better more clickable the thumbnail is the more people that click on the video we all know this so i've had some people say oh no i don't like the thumbnail like that's kind of clickbaity or like i know we talked about that but i just don't want my you know people to see that so even though that what was portrayed on the thumbnail was correct and reflective of what we talked about the creator for some reason didn't like it so of course i always honor those those requests i honor every request from my my guests to be honest because i'm just so grateful that they chose to be on the podcast in the first place but part of me is thinking like hey you know know the the YouTube game like you know that like you want a clickable thumbnail right like don't you get it but it is what it is I actually had one guest on the show who was absolutely lovely wonderful and she actually said hey I think that your thumbnail is not clickable enough like how about you have this and she sent me like some pictures some like bad pictures of her and she's like how about we put that on the thumbnail that would be really good like she was really cool so I get really cool people like that too All right, so now is a time of a juicy story that I wanna share with you guys of an experience that I had a few years ago with a guest. So I had this one YouTuber on the show that was very, very popular. I had so many people requesting to have her on. I was super excited to have her on because I was a fan of her content. She's beloved by her fans and I just knew that this was gonna be an amazing interview. So prior to coming onto the show, her manager wanted access to all of the questions. As a side note, I don't give a list of specific questions and this is actually not that unusual of a request. We do get people asking us for the questions, but my interviews, if you've listened to them, they are pretty organic. Granted, yes, I have a set of questions at the end of the interview, but the rest of the interview really is more of an organic conversation and I really like to keep it that way. Some interviewers have a strict set of questions, that's all they ask, they don't veer from that, but my style is a little bit different. So when people do ask, I give them the list of the questions at the end of the interview, which also, like I said, I don't love doing because part of it is I do want it to be organic like I want their response to be authentic and like in the moment I don't really want people to come on being super prepared but if they ask I will say okay here's a list of questions Uh, my assistant Sarah who's amazing actually is the one that does all this and she gives them a list of questions and then general topics of what we cover in the interview I also have my guests as I mentioned earlier fill out a questionnaire prior to the interview so we can narrow down the scope of the interview as well based on their experience on YouTube I want to keep things casual but I also want my guests to fill very comfortable knowing that they're safe in this interview and that you know whatever they want will be out and whatever they want won't but I want it to be a very casual conversation just as, as it is like friends having coffee and I hope you guys see that in the interviews actually when people ask for a list of questions it's actually not the creators themselves it's when I'm working with a creator who has a manager that we're communicating with the manager so just to kind of backtrack a little bit when we're booking talent for the podcast um, a lot of times it's just directly with the creator themselves I personally I prefer that because it's just nice to be able to like communicate directly with the creator but we also a lot of times will be communicating with an assistant or a manager and such it is in this case so in this case the creator's management was not okay with that which is what I've done with many other of my guests what she came back saying that the creator was tired about talking about those specific topics and she wanted a fresh set of questions and that she didn't want to be on the show if the questions that my assistant sent her which you know, was about her YouTube channel, like what this podcast is about, that she wouldn't be on the show if those are the questions that we were gonna ask. We obliged. Based on the questionnaire that I got from her, we did create a customized, fresh set of questions just for her and based off of what she did not wanna talk about, also based off of what she'd already talked about in other podcasts and didn't wanna talk about again on this podcast. I'd never done that before and I will not be doing that again you know lesson learned so my amazing assistant sarah as i mentioned was the one fielding all these emails and she was able to send her a brand new fresh set of questions based upon her criteria i also made accommodation in my schedule for her schedule to accommodate her time zone so that everything was good and she was good to go so i really did go above and beyond what is industry standard to make sure that this creator was happy and felt comfortable in the interview we conducted the interview and i have to say that this creator was wonderful during the interview she was 
kind. She was sweet. She was very generous with her advice. And I really enjoyed our time together. And I feel that the interview really reflects that. So I do feel like the interview itself is a wonderful interview and one that I know that my listeners and viewers really enjoyed. But after the interview, I thought that we were in the clear that you no, know, all the earlier stuff was just chalked up to some like miscommunications, but we were good to go. Oh, but but I was wrong. <laughs> no, 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 there was still more to come. So when I record my interviews, I batch record them. So I like to film a whole bunch of interviews at a time, like anywhere from like five to 10 interviews. And then I set up the content calendar and release them at later dates. My assistant notified the manager to let her know the release date. And the first response was, oh, well, we have to approve this interview, which is definitely not industry standard. And it's not something that I, I do at all. And it's not something that I've ever requested of people being on other podcasts. On top of that, they did not like the date that we chose because this creator was also going to be on another podcast and was going to be really busy and wrapped up with promoting that podcast. And she didn't want this one to be on at the same time. I also think it it, it had something to do with like her travel schedule too. So instead of being able to release it like a week or two later, she wanted it released like a month or so after that. The dates wasn't a problem. We totally accommodated that. We said, okay, great. So then when we came back and gave them another date, they actually wanted a series of dates and they needed to go back in order to examine the dates and determine which the proposed date is best for them. Mind you, I've never done this before. I'm never doing this again. So we gave them a series of dates, but Usually most people I give them a date and they're like, okay, great, awesome, thanks. You know, that's it. And vice versa, when I'm on podcasts, like I have no say in what date they're airing it. It's their content, I don't care. But apparently this creator, she did. She wanted to say in what date the podcast was gonna be released. I mean, even giving the date is a courtesy. Like I've been on podcasts and I didn't even know they were released. And and I'll even have people like, oh, you're on this podcast. I was like, oh, I didn't even, I, I didn't know it was gonna be released. Or sometimes I'm on a podcast and then I'll email them and be like, when's the release? date they're like oh yeah thanks for reaching out oh i think we're gonna do it this date or whatever just giving people a date ahead of time is a courtesy so after a whole bunch of back and forth and even going so far as to say hey let's hop on a call and let's just like bang this out let's come up with a date let's do this and we finally settled on a date and then they were pressing about seeing the interview they continued to insist that they needed to review and inter and approve the interview in order for it to go live and they did continue to argue that it was in fact an industry standard I have to tell you, I've been in the podcasting world since 2015, like I mentioned earlier. Like, I have been on some of the biggest podcasts on iTunes, uh, Pat Flynn, Smart Passive Income, Julie Solomon, Influencer Podcasts. Like, I know a lot of podcasters. This is not industry standard for people to send the interview and like have it approved. Can you imagine the logistics behind that if you had to literally do that for every single interview and like having to go back and make a bunch of changes? Like, it's a logistical nightmare and you would literally need an entire other like team person person on your team to handle something like that if that really was industry standard it's it's not i've even interviewed very 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 famous well-known podcasters and they were a breeze to work with like people that make millions of dollars with podcasting and have been podcasting for decades and never had any of these requests all that to say that this was not industry standard and then just to kind of give you an idea of like the email. Here's like what one of the emails said when we said, no, we don't do it. It's really not industry standard. Like it would increase production costs. And this is what she said. She says, there's no increase in production costs. It's a file transfer. Should there be any edits? I'm certain these will be minimal. And given we're in a similar industry, the editing out of a few sentences here and there takes quite literally seconds. So I look forward to receiving the files for approval prior to airing, please. Just like the tone of that email of like telling me that say they decided to want to like take out a bunch of stuff it's going to take literally seconds anyways it just gives you an idea of the type of of communication we were having from them so i still really want to accommodate this guest and i'm telling you it was a lesson learned <laughs> I'm never doing that with another guest again, and I haven't since then, and I won't ever again. So we sent over the footage. This was a mistake because the management team came back and said that they actually only consented to audio, not video. I'm like, wait, what? <laughs> we make it so clear in every single piece of communication that there's video involved. The talent, the creator, she was on video. She asked me, how's my video look? Like, how do I look? She knew it was gonna be on video. Every single form that a guest fills out says it's on video. Every email, the first correspondence, it's on video. Like, there's no assumptions were made though. Like even though like anyone that knows the show knows it's on videos, no, we have it in writing in all the correspondence. And she 
the guest was video ready. She was in front of a video. She had a video on. So that was a lie. And once we went back and forth about that and reminded her of that, she said, well, regardless, at this point, it's just too late. And we're like, too late? Like, what do you mean? Well, the interview at this point was filmed months ago and now the advice is just stale and because of that, we don't approve it. Remember what we said earlier, how like she asked us to delay the release date because it didn't coincide with her schedule and then all the back and forth about the date and then now all the back and forth about the footage, that is what delayed it. But the content itself, it's about being a creator. It is not stale. There was nothing stale about it. And I'm thinking like, this is my platform. I wouldn't want a bad interview to be on my platform. I'm the one that makes that decision. After months and months of back and forth, of us literally accommodating every single request that she had, she decided that she was not gonna sign off on this interview. The other thing that she mentioned too at one point was that they didn't like the lighting in the video. Okay, well, it had nothing to do with the lighting in my video, it was the lighting on her end of the video. Well, you know, the, that was her lighting. <laughs> I don't mind it, it's going on my channel, but I digress, there was just something else that was thrown in there. But you know what? It's my show. And I didn't care. At that point, after months of this, of realizing like how manipulative these people were and entitled, I was like, no. We have like hours and hours of work behind this episode at this point. I still released it. I released it. I never heard from the creator. And that's it. The rest is history. And also, I want to put a side note here. It was a great interview. It was a fantastic interview. And that anybody that would watch this interview would fall in love with the creator if they didn't know who she was already. So there was nothing bad about the interview or nothing about the interview that like made her look bad or anything. It was a wonderful interview. And I've got so many amazing feedback and comments about that interview. People saying that was a fantastic interview. So I truly think it made her look really good. So there was so much valuable information in that interview that I didn't want to hold it back over something silly like this. And so I was thinking about you guys. I was like, my honest is going to love this interview. It was great. And so, yeah, I released it. And I can't imagine this creator being nearly this accommodating if the roles were reversed. If she had her own podcast or show and we're having people on the show. I can't imagine she would go to the lengths that I went to to ensure that this woman was happy. To me, this experience is an example of an inflated ego that so many influencers, I think, are now getting and why I think influencers sometimes get a bad rap. I started this episode by saying 99% of the people that I've worked with are absolutely amazing and lovely people. They're just a few bad apples here and there. I think this creator sees herself as a celebrity and that her needs, desires, and wants go above anybody else's. So after years of podcasting and interviewing hundreds and hundreds and hundreds of women, I think it's safe to say that considering that that was the worst experience I've ever had, my experience overall being a podcaster and interviewing people and getting to know YouTube creators has been pretty good overall. I mean, if that's the worst thing that's happened, eh, it's not that bad. It's just more an inconvenience. Like my assistant and I had a, had a good time being like, what are they gonna come up with next? She'd be like, oh my God, can you believe? Oh my God, look at this email. In a lot of ways, like we laugh at it and it's like kind of like a, a fun bonding moment between me and my assistant and it's just a story to tell. It was just, I was just more in shock at like the entitlement of this person. And keep in mind that this happened years ago. I've had hes hesitated to tell this story even without naming the creator just because I don't want to put anyone in a bad light or to gossip about anybody because that's not what this channel is about. This channel truly is about inspiring people and learning from other creators. But I, I do get a lot of people asking me about my experience. So I wanted to put this video together and part of it is my truth and my experience. And it's kind of one of the things that I've experienced and dealt with. So partly is my story story to tell as well and that's part of the reason why I did not include the creator's name because honestly who the creator is doesn't matter it's just the fact that this happened that I think is really interesting but overall I say I'm very lucky to have been doing this podcast and to continue doing it and to have had amazing, wonderful experiences with so many creators. I chose, I feel truly blessed to have found a niche or an industry where the people are just, are awesome. They really are. So did anything I share surprise you? I wanna know like, what's your history with the podcast? Did you, are you familiar with it back when it was Beauty and the Vlog? Share with me kind of your story about the podcast, like how you discovered it. What are some of your favorite episodes? I love learning more 
about you guys and how the podcast has helped you in your own life. And make sure you check out this video here where I talk all about the difference between podcasting and having a YouTube channel. That one is really informative if you are even interested in you know having your own podcast. And make sure you subscribe if you haven't and like the video. Mwah. Oh,